And this morning, our privilege is to uh, bring uh, Chris Galloway to talk about Alberta's public health care isn't broken, it's being dismantled, and he will be introduced today by a long-term social justice group member, Sylvia Crow. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is a welcoming place to visit. We welcome you, whoever you are, wherever you come from, whoever you love, wherever you are in your faith journey, and whether you have big questions, doubts, or wherever you are in your life, this is the place to be. We're also located on Treaty 6 land. This is a legacy shared with us by all of the First Nations people whom we honor and witness and by respecting their traditions. Hello. Hello. I'm going to start again. <laughs> Ask me what uh, Murphy's Law is and I will tell you. The Unitarian Church of Edmonton is located on Treaty 6 land, a legacy shared with us by all of the First Nations people whom we honor and witness by respecting their traditions and working with them to ensure the 94 calls to action from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission are fulfilled. This is not an easy task. It requires supporting indigenous actions as allies to protect the environment, to promote land rights, social justice, and human rights. May we be strong and loving and great in this project. Now I have to ask if there are any announcements to be made. Please come forward to the microphone. Oksana, hello. Good morning. I just wanted to let uh, everybody know about two different things. First of all, we have uh, a portion of our church who is out in Vancouver right now. So we have Maria, our youth advisor, along with some youth and young adults who are there as part of Canoodle, the conference uh, that they've been looking forward to attending for over two years now. So they're finally meeting in person. So our, our thoughts and our heart extend all the way out to them out on the West Coast. Um, the second is just a note from religious education about our theme today in terms of health. Uh, the World Health Organization says that health is a state of complete physical, mental, and social well-being. It's not just the absence of disease. And because it incorporates mental health, which is such an important part of our lives, I've just included a, a quote in the back there that looks at how the Public Health Agency of Canada defines mental health and how spirituality equity and social justice are a part of that definition. So that's just something to, to look at later. Thank you very much. That reminds me to encourage you to look at the uh, medicine banner that we have up there. It certainly is a First Nations concept of what holistic health is, spiritual and physical and of the land. Now we will start with Gordon Ritchie playing a prelude.
I would like to invite our guest, Chris Galloway, to come and light our chalice. Would you do that, please? Thank you for being with us today. We light, our, we light our chalice to remind us that we are all part of one community. What happens to one of us happens to all of us. We stand and fall together. This flame inspires us to work for the worth and dignity of all humanity as we bless our work for peace and justice. Thank you, Chris. Our first hymn this morning is hymn number 298, Wake Now My Senses. One of the ways we show respect and love for our community is to make sure that it continues to be here, that it continues to do the work outlined in our Unitarian Universalist principles. In that context, we support the Unitarian Church of Edmonton financially and donate half the general collection to a local or global char charitable or organization. The collection plates are supposed to be over there somewhere at the back okay thank you thank you the collection will now be taken oh no sorry it won't it at the end of the program you can place your offerings in the collection plate and we will now sing from you I receive introduce our speaker. Okay. My name is Sylvia Crow, and I'm a member of the Unitarian Social Justice Group. 
And um, as some of you know, in 2013, I had cancer. And so every three weeks, I went for a week to the Cross Cancer Institute and had chemotherapy. And after a year of that, I came out healthy, and it didn't cost me a cent. And I am so grateful to Canada's public health care system, and I wanted to make sure that everybody has equality and has access to that, regardless of income. So therefore, when I heard Chris speak, I thought, this is wonderful. His words need to be um, spread throughout Alberta. Um, and Canada, actually. Um, Chris is an experienced community organizer and advocate for public health care. Born and raised on a farm in rural Saskatchewan, he has since spent most of his adult life living on tra Treaty 6 territory, first in Saskatoon and for the last decade living here in Edmonton. His past experience includes working for the Alberta Federation of Labour in three provincial legislative assemblies and for a variety of nonprofit and community organizations. Outside of work, Chris is an active volunteer and community member engaged in social justice and the arts. So I invite you up, Chris, and Chris will speak for a while, and then um, we will uh, have questions from the audience. Hey, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here in person with people in the real world. It's a new change I've been doing lately. I'm very excited to see faces, but also thanks to, I know there's some folks on Zoom as well. Um, but it's really good to be here. I've been speaking at a lot of rallies lately, so I'm gonna try not to start yelling at you. Um, but that has been kind of what's happening in healthcare right now. Um, so I'll, I'll try, to, try to keep a level voice. I'm not much of a yeller until recently, so here we are. Um, but great to be here. I actually drove up from Red Deer today. I visited my brother for a couple days over the long weekend, and I was thinking a lot about what I should say this morning, and there's kind of two things I've been hearing over and over and over again as I've been driving around Alberta lately. The first, unfortunately, is from our premier and our government who keep telling us our health care is broken, and our only option is to privatize this off to fix it. And the second thing I've been hearing a lot, including this week, there's been a few things in politics this week, if you've read the news, is from Albertans who over and over again say how frustrated they are with how incompetent Jason Kenney and his government have been. And I want to tell you that both of those things aren't true. The second one might be a bit true, watching what's happened this week, you know, debatable. But what's happening in our health care is not an accident, it's intentional. They're breaking it so they can justify privatizing it to their friends and using our public dollars to facilitate that profit. It's an age-old strategy, you break it, and then you privatize it. And I'm not denying that there's huge issues in healthcare right now, it's just in Red Deer where it's the heart of the issues. You know, we have families with children lining up outside of ERs because they can't even get in the waiting room. We have an opioid crisis that's just running rampant through our communities. You know, we have red alerts in our EMS system. They actually created a new term recently, deep red alerts, because they didn't know how to describe how much worse it had got than the worst case scenario. That's what's happening in healthcare right now. I'm hearing from thousands and thousands of Albertans who've lost their family doctor. Probably some people in this room have lost their family doctor recently. But all these crises were created by the decisions of the government. They're not an accident. They ripped up the contract with the doctors. They went to war with nurses and healthcare workers. They're still proposing wage rollbacks at the bargaining table, and we wonder why professionals are leaving their profession in the province, right? Five people every single day in Alberta are dying from drug poisoning, and I get very upset about this. The minister stands up in the legislature and mocks the idea of using harm reduction or science or evidence, literally used air quotes, in the legislature. We don't see any compassion from that minister. Instead, we see ideological and people are dying. We saw this government declare the best summer ever, you may remember. Some of you may have seen a musical about that, not sure. Uh, they declared the best summer ever against public health advice. And then our hospitals were full, the fullest ever. The wait times got out of control, our staffing issues got out of control. They made that decision. And as we struggle with staffing, they continue to attack post-secondary institutions in this province. Deep cuts, labor strife, huge tuition hikes, 
That's not how we're going to have the people we need to run the healthcare system in the years ahead. So I don't think we can let them off the hook. It's on us to call them out, say we know what you're doing, we don't support it, Albertans don't support it, and stop it. And if we don't do that, they're moving fast and furious. So I wanna to touch on kind of the four top things Friends of Medicare's doing right now. Uh, there's so much in healthcare, every single week uh, something happens pretty much. I was actually saying just before it started, this is the first week they haven't privatized something since I've been in this role since January because they were too busy with Jason Kenney's leadership to get to privatizing anything this week. It was a nice relief uh, for us. But that is our top thing right now, privatization. And pretty much every single week, I started this job in January. Since I've started, they've announced some sort of plan to privatize or cut something. Whether it's our community labs with a sweetheart deal to Dynalife, EMS where they've queued it up for all sorts of privatization to deal with the red alerts, ophthalmology, surgeries, laundry, food services, any sliver they can find that could make a profit for someone, they're carving off, giving them long-term contracts with guaranteed profits with our money. So that's our top thing we're pushing on right now. I will say, especially if you're on Zoom, it'll be easier. If you go to friendsofmedicare.org slash take action, we have all sorts of actions uh, that you can take. There's an anti-lab privatization, some other petitions. So just mention that while I'm here. The second thing we're really focused on is seniors care. You probably saw during the pandemic how our seniors care system is functioning right now or not functioning. Continuing care is a disaster. So many people died because of the pandemic. We saw how people can't even afford to live working in those facilities. They need two or three jobs to get by. So we're really focused on calling nationally and provincially for standards in seniors care the real problem is having profit in the system. Uh, it creates a perverse incentive where they siphon off the money, but there should be minimum care standards, minimum staffing ratios. People deserve dignity, right? And from the government, we're hearing all this talk of home care and how, we'll, you know, we want to keep more people at home and that'll solve the problem. And of course, like of course people want to stay at home if they can. Why wouldn't you? But we're not providing that support either, right? People aren't safe at home with the support they're getting. The whole system is built on the idea that you have family or friends who can come and help. Because if you don't, you won't have the care you need at home. You'll end up in the hospital. You'll end up living in an acute care bed because you can't go home, but there's nowhere to go. So yes, we need to address home care, but we also have a seniors care system we need to address. We are actively right now calling for uh, a seniors advocate. There's a campaign under the Alberta Seniors Deserve Better campaign you may have seen over the years um, to bring back that office of the seniors advocate. So seniors have a place to go when there's an issue to navigate. I don't know if you've ever tried to navigate the system, but it's, it's a gong show and it's, so us along with Public Interest Alberta and a bunch of seniors groups are pushing that. Well, there's a lot more to come from us on seniors care as we head to an election. It's a disaster and we need to act. So that's one of our top, I'm giving you four. That was two, there'll be a test after. Um, the third uh, is really the drug poisoning crisis. It's become such a top priority for us, working with community groups, working with healthcare workers, frontline folks, uh, like five people every single day in our province are dying unnecessarily. It's absurd. We're calling on all levels of government to act. We've seen action from the city of Edmonton uh, moving forward with a push on decriminalization and some other, the admins exploring other options of what they can do within their powers. There's a federal private members bill. On June 1st, there'll be a vote on moving that forward or not. Uh, Gord Johns is the MP from BC who tabled it around decriminalization, a national strategy on substance, et cetera. Blake Desjardins, the MP from Edmonton Griesbaugh is helping work on that. So stay tuned on that. And then we have a provincial government who mocks people that try to raise this as a crisis, who shuts down consumption sites. I was down in Lethbridge um, last weekend, whenever the rallies were, the Raging Grannies will know. Whenever the rally was, I was in Lethbridge. Um, and they shut down the busiest safe consumption site in the country and opened a little trailer in a field, right? That's what they're doing. It's so upsetting. We've made it a top priority because more people have died from overdose than COVID in this province. It's, it's ridiculous. So we're definitely speaking up on that and that'll be a huge priority going forward. What's our fourth priority? All right, the positive one. Um, I, I come everywhere and bring just like the worst news to the room and go like, everything's broken because they're breaking it on purpose and then they're gonna give it all away. And everyone's like, thanks for coming. Um, <laughs> 
So the, our other priority, and has been for years, you know, part of our mandate at Friends of Medicare, I should have said at the start, we're a nonprofit membership-based organization. We don't take money from corporations or governments, so we can advocate on health care. Um, and our mandate is to both protect public health care, but also to strengthen it and expand it. And so pharmacare has been such an issue we've been pushing on for so long. We're continuing to push. We have a group called the Alberta Pharmacare Working Group that we've restarted to really push this fight again. You've probably seen federally there's a, an agreement between the Liberals and the NDP, the Confidence and Supply Agreement, um, that includes pharmacare. So there's hope on the horizon for this. We saw with dental care, uh, a few weeks before the federal budget, not a person was talking about dental care in this country. They signed this agreement. Children in Canada will get dental care this year. It's amazing. We should celebrate that. They've also showed they can move quickly if they actually want to. Like, they did that in a few weeks. They're like, sure, let's do it. Why not? After years of doing nothing. Uh, so Pharmacare, it's in the agreement. There's supposed to be an act next year with a plan to roll it out from there. We're very worried about the Liberal government actually following through on this commitment. They've been in power many years. They've promised Pharmacare throughout. They haven't done it. And at every turn, when they have an opportunity to move it forward, they delay. They just delayed again a drug pricing uh, thing that was supposed to start right away, and they delayed it by six more months. So every chance they've had, they've backed down to the pharmaceutical lobby. So we're really pushing, we have an email tool, we're pushing, especially if you live in Edmonton Center, where the, the only Liberal MP in this city is, we're pushing hard to say, do it. You've promised it. it. Canadians want it, if you ask them. Do it, right? So please join us in that push, because I think there's a huge opportunity to expand public health care. It will save us money in the system and overall. I won't go into a long rant to why it's the smart thing to do, but it's also the compassionate thing to do. And I think it gives people hope. And when we're talking to people, you know, we've had two years of this pandemic, and when I talk to them, they want, they're like, yeah, everything's awful, I'm tired, I'm burnt out. I see a quote on mental health there on the billboard, or the whiteboard. People want something to push for that they can feel hopeful about. That's why I think we need to celebrate dental care and say, let's do more. We can do more together. And I know if we go to Albertans with that message, they will get on board. Because if you ask them, they support public health care. People are proud of it. They have stories about why it's important to them. They don't actually reflect across partisan lines or, or ideology. Albertans strongly support public health care, even if the government right now does not. So I think we need to bring people in with that message. And we, we saw that that can work just a week ago. You've probably all seen or been following the very cruel, short-sighted, just frustrating decision by the government to cut the insulin pump program in this province. It's just absurd to save $9 million. It'll cost us far more than that. But in response to that, folks with type 1 diabetes gathered quickly. We joined with them. We called out the government to say, no, you won't do this. We invited people in. And thousands and thousands, I'm going to lose count, and thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of Albertans wrote to their MLA saying no. They called their MLA. They showed up the ledge. Like, you will not cut this. You're not taking insulin pumps from children in this province. We care for each other in this province. No way. And the government has actually stopped. This is one of the first things I can remember in three years where they balked and said, uh-oh, the public's mad. So they've paused that decision. They've promised to consult. We're very worried that that's a stalling tactic based on the consultation that happened. But we showed that we can scare them if we organize, we need to do a heck of a lot more of it for public health care. You know, so we had rallies on the weekend. There's more to come. Probably leave it at that. I could talk about health care forever right now, what's happening in this province. But I'm actually very hopeful. When I talk to people, they support public health care. They're worried about it. It's top of mind. It's the top issue everyone's thinking about, including oil companies who folks were meeting with recently, saying our health care is screwed. How are we going to have workers in this province? So I'm super hopeful that we can get there if you join. There is Friends of Medicare leaflets at the back. You can grab, check out to join as a member and go to our website. There's many actions you can take. And I'll leave it at that. And I'm going to answer some questions, but only easy questions. Easy questions. I think Sylvia grabbed the mic. Oh, you grabbed the mic. Okay. Yeah. My, um, Sylvia will come around with the mic. Please speak directly into it so they can pick it up, up in the, uh, the uh, booth. 
Um, I remember back in the 90s, it's like 30 years ago, um, there was a crisis with opt ophthalmology. Mm -hmm. We had the, the central place in Edmonton at the Royal Alec Hospital. So there wasn't a problem in Edmonton, but there was in Calgary. Now it seems to me that I heard recently the opposite is now true. They are a little bit better in Calgary, but now they're closing that facility in the Royal Alec Hospital. Why are they doing that? Because they want to privatize it. That's basically what they announced. Uh, it's actually still true that Edmonton uh, has better wait times than Calgary. Edmonton has public ophthalmology services. Calgary has private. It's, and so they're privatizing the better service. Um, and part of the reason for that is ophthalmologists upsell and do other things once they have you in the room, right? There's other things you can do beyond the cataracts or the, the basic pieces, needles. There's things they do. Um, and so once they start doing that, they actually see fewer patients uh, in a day. Uh, so Edmonton has shorter wait times, but soon will be closed and privatized and who knows. And all of those contracts are, with all these things, not public because it's proprietary. So we don't actually know. They claim they'll save money, but we don't actually know what they pay for services in Calgary versus Edmonton because they don't tell us that. And we'll never know that. So they can go around claiming they'll save money, but highly unlikely. They will, but yeah, they're closing the better service to privatize it out. And they did have an ophthalmologist at the press conference very excited about how good news this would be. So you kind of wonder whose interests they're serving in that scenario. Uh -oh. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. I'm Judy Hageman. I'm a social activist as well as a member of this church and as well a priest. I am a priest of the goddess Bridget. I'm a witch. Social justice is very much of a passion. I'm also a senior, and I have grave concerns of what Kenny government is doing against us seniors in terms of health care. I have also have proudly and happily attended the last two rallies in protection of the public health care system. And I would like to know as to whether or not you know when, when and where and the date of the next one, please. Good question. Um, there is a rally this Wednesday at the legislature that the Health Science Association is putting on. It's specific to talk about the need for sick days and addressing COVID. Um, so it's not about the whole healthcare system. That is the next one I know of. But part of doing the rallies last weekend was trying to get people used to coming back in person. It's been a real struggle with COVID and you know people are living their lives differently to really get people to show up again. So it's really restarting that culture of we're going to show up and loudly say no way. And we did it across the province in five cities that day. I was down on Lethbridge. There was probably 100 people on a beautiful, sunny, not windy Saturday in Lethbridge, which was very confusing. Um, and I think there'll be more the more we do it. But we don't have a date set for a, a public health care rally that will be next. But there will be, for sure. Hi, good morning. Uh, Lynn Turvey here. Um, just simply in your opinion, with the experience that you're enjoying, I guess, <laughs> in some ways, what do you feel is the reason behind this push for privatization? Is it simply ideology, or is there something else going on here? What, what, what are they, how are they trying to sell this to the, the public? They sell it to the public as addressing issues, whether it's wait lists or whatever the issue will be. They'll claim, we'll do this and it'll solve that. We know it's not true. We, we can look next door to Saskatchewan on the surgeries and see that it actually costs them more and their wait lists are worse than they've ever been. But now they just do more private surgeries in the province. Uh, it was really just a move to, to make it private. It's ideology. We're seeing a very ideological conservative movement in Canada right now. The premiers across the country are following this playbook. Doug Ford in Ontario and Saskatchewan next door. Can anyone name the premier of Saskatchewan? I'm from there. Scott Moe. No one ever knows who he is when they see him on the news. Who's that guy? He's the guy who does whatever Kenny did like a week later. Um, but they're doing it across the country. It's coordinated uh, and it's ideological. They, they're, they don't want to come out directly against public health care, although John Charest now has in the federal leadership race said we should have a private health care system separate from the public one. Um, so they're very, they've just moved to this very ideological place and the COVID pandemic gave them an excuse to push it fast. Right? 
Uh, there was this crisis. I was at the Alberta Federation of Labor before this, and they did this with education as well. They used COVID as an excuse to do all sorts of things they would have never got away with before, including laying off 25,000 people at the start of the pandemic. Uh, and we wrote a whole series on how they were doing, it's called disaster capitalism, happens all the time where a crisis happens and these ideologues come in and dismantle the public good. And they're doing it across the country right now. And unfortunately, it looks like Doug Ford might get reelected and he's talking about private hospital wings and all sorts of stuff. So yeah, it's, it's scary. And I don't think people realize how fast it's happening, right? That they take it for granted that when they call for an ambulance, it'll show up and when they go to the ER, it'll be there. And that's actually not happening in Alberta right now. And that's surprising people, but it's a consequence of what's been happening. Yeah. So there's an election coming up in about a year, a little over. Would a change of government be in a position to do anything about these contracts that the UCP are signing? Yeah, it depends. Um, we're we're nonpartisan at Friends of Medicare, but I do think a new government would be a very good idea um, because this one is very aggressive. Um, but yeah, the minister was actually asked about this when it came to the ophthalmology contracts, uh, and the, the reporters asked, you know, if, if you lose government in the, you know, next month or next year or whenever this election happens, you know what? what do these contracts look like? And he said they are long-term contracts with guaranteed volumes for the provider. So they're locking us in now because they realized last time they lost, which they never thought they would, that the, the government could get out of a bunch of these things. So I'm very worried about some of these recent announcements and how locked in will be or the, or the cost of getting out of some of these agreements they're signing. It, it's very concerning and we won't know until there's a change in government because those contracts aren't public. But the minister has very directly said they're long-term guaranteed contracts. So, which actually means if we got rid of the wait list and there's only so much work, we have to prioritize the private provider over the public system because we've guaranteed them so much work. It's, it's ridiculous. Hi. Hi. Um, you know, you made the comment about one of the reasons or maybe the primary reason being ideology. Mm -hmm. um, seems to me in Alberta, there's also nepotistic sorts of things, a lot of that happening, um, you know, where contracts are, or the policy changes are benefiting friends and families yeah. of, uh, of the cabinet. Um, so is that, that was just a comment, but my question was actually around media yeah. and what your experience has been trying to work with them to really highlight these issues more consistently and keeping them on the forefront. Uh, of the media stories, because I don't see that. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm wondering if you could comment on that. Thank For you. For sure, that's great. Um, and yeah, to your comment about friends, if you, there's a lobbyist registry in Alberta, you can go read it. You can see all these companies just lined up lobbying this government for contracts. When they announced their committee to look at the EMS red alerts, it includes people who operate private ambulance services who are then gonna recommend what to do about it. Like it's very connected, it's gross. Um, but in terms of the media, I've actually, had quite a bit of luck because it's such a top of mind issue for Albertans now they are following it closely one of the problems is there's just so little media left in this province they have no staff um, the Red Deer Advocate is now my favorite uh, media in the province because they'll just print anything you give them because they have no staff left uh, so there, I had an op-ed there over the weekend if go check it out and you'll see why the minister didn't welcome me to town but um, they are very open. They know healthcare matters to people. They know it's getting them clicks and attention, um, but they are underwhelmed. But they've shown up to everything we've done. Whenever the government announces something, I get calls immediately now. Um, CTV is my best friend. I joke to my parents now. They watch Edmonton CTV in Saskatchewan. Because like, oh, you're on again. It's like, yeah, they privatized again. Um, yeah, so the media is actually very open. And, I, and if you have like letters or you're doing things, I think they are right now. It's such a top issue that they are uh, very open to covering it. There's just so little of it. And then social media really skews who sees what, right? People aren't consuming it in the way. So, you know, to us, we need to get back out in the world more. We're tabling more. We're going to be at markets. We're going to do that kind of stuff and really try to reach people where they're at uh, because we can't count on people seeing the media uh, to, to see that. So, yeah. Uh, hi, it's Brenda. I'm just wondering, I don't really know what the implications of privatization are like m maybe besides saving money uh, it could also furnish better service or what's the track record there mm -hmm. 
It's a good question because that is, they always claim it'll save money and the track record is it never does because uh, there's a profit motive. So the only way they can tr save money is by cutting corners or paying people less and that can only last for so long. Um, so the track record is usually worse uh, on almost every metric. I could go through lots of examples on that. Um, but it also means we give up control. It's very concerning with labs that they're doing this because if there was another pandemic, what would we have to do to get the lab capacity we need? Um, Australia is a great example. If you're nerdy like me, go, go read about this. But Australia has private hospitals. They have, a, they have two systems. And when the pandemic hit, the private hospital said, we're gonna lay everyone off unless you bail us out. You can't use our hospitals for COVID unless you pay us billions of dollars. So the public had to pay those private hospitals to stay open for the pandemic because it wasn't the, their contract wasn't for that. It was for other things, right? And that happened with surgeries, with all these things. Uh, we see, we give up control. We give up capacity. It'll cost us more over the long term. And we see things like, I don't know if you saw the CBC story on Friday of the woman from Saskatchewan who paid to have her surgery done in Calgary, $28,000 to get her if it was her hip or her knee, uh, replacement done to skip the queue in Saskatchewan. So with people who have money, suddenly find ways to get health care while the rest of us wait. So it, it's all those pieces, right? Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm uh, Edda Lumsen. I'm from UC um, Westwood, uh, Social Justice Committee. Uh, have you heard of SALT, mm -hmm. Seniors Action and Liaison Team? Yes. They're having a Zoom meeting this Tuesday at one o'clock with Ricardo Acuna, Acuna, mm -hmm. and he's talking about the Kenny government and what is happening. So if you're interested in that, SALT, S-A-L-T, Seniors Action and Liaison Team, this Tuesday at one o'clock via Zoom. And if you don't have an iPad or a computer, you can use your telephone. You can just uh, get the number. That's great. Yeah, they're a great organization. They actually have a representative on our board at Friends of Medicare. Uh, I spoke to them a, a couple months ago, so people should check them out for sure. They always have good speakers. Hi, my name is Sarah Elliott. Um, related to what you were saying earlier about people jumping the queue, um, what on a one-to-one -one level, how would you recommend speaking with people who say that they see the need for public health care, but they would like to jump the queue if they need like an elective procedure or any kind of, yeah. you know, they're saying, yes, I understand the need, but I really want to be able to take advantage of a, a private system. Yeah, when you get why people do it, right? When we have a scenario where it's two or three years, you're gonna be waiting. Of course, people look at options if they can. There's all sorts of ways to jump the queues too, because there's, there's steps, right? So if you can, there's testing you often need before you can get like an MRI or whatever it is. If you can jump that queue, you get further into the surgery line, right? There's lots of points. I get why people do it. They're often in pain, they're waiting a long time. Uh, and what we really need to do is get rid of the wait lists. And we can do that in the public system. And we've seen that uh, there's lots of examples of where you prioritize it, you get rid of the wait list and then it's not an issue anymore, right? People shouldn't be waiting three years for their knee surgery. That's well beyond the like, I forget the, the technical term, I'm not a doctor, but there's like the, the ideal wait time for, for different things, and we're well past lots of those. So really, we need to pump money into the system to get through that backlog, which Saskatchewan, so they point to the example of Saskatchewan opening private surgical facilities uh, here, saying we want to do that, it's good news. But what Saskatchewan actually did is they announced these private clinics, but they also pumped a bunch of money into getting more surgeries done. So their wait times dropped briefly in those months after they made the announcement. But as soon as they stopped doing that extra money into the system, it dropped back to where it was, right? So it had nothing to do with public and private. It had to do with how many surgeries they were paying to do it a year, right? And so we could do the same thing. We do have a staffing issue right now. Uh, so we would actually have to take COVID seriously and not have our hospitals be overrun and have people showing up for their surgery and having it canceled when they're already in the hospital. You know, that's happening to people right now. I get why they're frustrated. Um, but we could deal with the wait lists, and then we wouldn't be having a conversation about queue jumping because there wouldn't be a need. But that is a hard, harder conversation because people need their health dealt with now, right? So, yeah. Any more questions? I like that they're always far away. Sylvia's really getting her, her steps in. Good this exercise. <laughs> 
I'm just wondering what your thoughts are on a system. You know, th there is this ideology to privatize. Mm -hmm. And while I think ideal ideally we stay public, I don't know, like, what are your thoughts are on privatization that has a lot of regulations around it? So, for example, you may do the cataract surgery in a private system. However, you may not bill more than what the public system charges. Mm -hmm. um, so volumes can potentially increase. Like, for example, many physicians work by fee-for-service, so their volumes can increase, but there's no incentive to, to leave the public system because your rate per procedure remains the same. So I don't know if this kind of um, sort of middle of the road type of situation where you're not fully private, you're not fully public, but maybe there's privatization, but that is highly regulated with a lot of rules uh, as opposed to a free for all. Mm -hmm. I don't know what your thoughts are on that. Uh, I mean, I've been thinking about this for a while and just was wondering. Yeah, yeah that's, that's a great question. And it kind of goes to the point about the contracts from over here earlier. Um, we do have, like, for seniors care is a great example. We have these private operators. If we're not going to rip up the contracts and take them back, we better put in some very firm regulations. Because right now, they're awful places to work and live. So, sure, if you want to be a private operator, we better make you have high standards. And it may be a disincentive to even do it, because they want to make a profit. They're really real estate companies. They're not senior care companies. Um, but with surgeries and things, it's more complicated, because by opening a private surgical center, you're not creating more surgeons or nurses, so they poach. Right? And we're actually hearing about that in Grand Prairie right now, that there, there's advertisement to the folks in the hospital to try to get them to leave and go work in the private surgical center because they need the workers. So you're kind of, anytime you fragment the system, it's, it creates a staffing issue on top, right? Um, so it depends on the scenario, but definitely we have these contracts similar to the long-term ophthalmology contracts. We better darn well go back and say, here's the minimum standards and, and look at those kind of issues if they're gonna exist. Yeah, I, I... Oh, oh. it's on the screen. Sorry, yeah. Oh, look at that. That is a good question. Um, staffing is the number one issue in healthcare right now. That's why we're seeing so many issues. Uh, I was at the Alberta Federation of Labor uh, midterm forum the other day, and every time I was talking to a paradigmic or a paramedic, yeah, paramedic, or a nurse, their phone would be going off and going off and going off as they're trying to call them into work while they're at the convention. And that's every day they're off, right? It's a huge problem. Uh, I think a huge piece of it is actually just about respect. We need to stop. Like, they're driving people out in huge numbers right now. We need to retain who we have. We need to convince some people to come back. And then we need to really have, you know, basically since Christmas, we've been calling for a workforce strategy where they actually sit down with the unions and AHS and the universities and say, how are we going to train people? Because we have a huge problem. But step one is stop losing people and get people back. And then step two is figuring out the longer term, um, which they're not doing right now. They're gutting post-secondary. So it, it's quite terrifying. Because we're not going to be able to just poach from other provinces. They're poaching from us is the current scenario. Um, we need to actually figure out how we're going to train who we need where we need them. And I saw someone with the mic still. Grant Harleton here. Uh, is there anything on the radar to do with dental care? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so federally in that national agreement between the NDP and Liberals, uh, it's a multi-year plan to push dental care forward. So starting this year, children 12, 12 and under, under 12, uh, will have access to dental care in Canada through a public national program. Um, next year, it'll include 18 and under, as well as seniors and folks living on disability, and there's all these categories. And then every year it rolls out. Uh, the only criticism we would have of that the plan is when it's fully implemented, there's an income cap. So it's income tested, so not everyone will have access to it, which when you do that, it makes it less inefficient and all sorts of issues. We have a progressive income tax system for a reason. We should have universal health care programs. Um, but they are moving very quickly on ensuring people have access. There will be questions about how, how far that access will go, because dental needs can be quite complex. Uh, it's actually very frustrating. Right now with children in Alberta, the number one surgery they get in hospital is because of dental issues, because they don't have their dental issues dealt with until it, it's a health issue 
under our definition of health, right? So it's actually huge progress to see that kids will actually have preventative dental care in this province. And, you know, dental is one of the biggest class indicators still in our province. You, you know, it's, it's a very visual identifier, although masks have changed that a bit. Um, but yeah, it's happening for sure. And we'll have more thoughts on it as we see how they roll it out. But it's very exciting to see the federal government just say, yeah, we're going to do it. Um, just uh, uh, one comment. A lot of the debate in Canada becomes this U.S.-Canada thing. And, I, and just from experience, there aren't many people, frankly, who want the U.S. system. I, mm -hmm. I know it's positioned, but just I... But there's uh, a lot of European systems, a lot of Nordic systems, the system in New Zealand, the system in Germany, the system in the U.K., have all sorts of quite different mixes of financing and various things which uh, may be that are highly regulated, different mixes of services, and often provide more service and more uh, benefits than Canada does, because we just fund hospitals and doctors primarily through the Canada Health Act. And so what, how do you deal with the arguments that there are some potential options of mixed financing systems that come from Europe that highly regulate the private sector, ensure universal coverage, and coverage a lot there's far less patient contributions and more benefits are covered than the Canadian um, uh, system, which actually has much more patchy, uh, funds a lot, to, two things to 100%, and then really bad coverage elsewhere. Mm -hmm. um, so just the European systems of mixed financing that might provide some solutions to explore. And I find whenever you mention that in Canada, uh, there's a huge aggressive action from, from friends of Medicare and others about, about, oh, that's trying to sneak in particular kind of things. But I do think there's some interesting options from European and Nordic countries that are committed to universal health care coverage. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that's a good point. And for instance, we're the only OECD country that has health care that doesn't have pharmacare as part of it, which is actually really stupid and costly of us to do it that way. And there's lots of examples of things we've decided aren't health somehow that actually cost us more to our healthcare system because we don't deal with them as the upstream issue they would be if we dealt with them there. We also don't house people and obviously that has all those things, right? And so that is part of the comparison. Most of those countries have extremely high taxes on wealthy folks and corporations. They have sectoral unionization. Um, there's, it's a very different economic reality. Um, when I worked with the Alberta Federation of Labor and we were dealing with the coal phase out, a lot of Germans came here to look at what we were doing and we're like just baffled by like well why wouldn't unions just be at the table with the government and the employer the whole way through it's like oh because we're in north america and not europe right so it's hard to compare a lot of what they do um just in terms of the wider economic and fiscal context they're in um we would have to change a lot of things i think to be able to really look at that because basically we're using privatization to make crappy jobs uh in healthcare is the main reason we privatize, whether it's seniors care, laundry, whatever it is, they flip a contract, people start making casual minimum wage. Even paramedics right now, there are hundreds of paramedics in this province who are on 89 day contracts, and every 89 days they're laid off and they get a new contract because they're casual, so they don't even have sick days at a time when we don't have enough paramedics, but we're not making them full time. Like So it, it's very hard to compare. There's a lot more to learn on that for sure. It's, I'm not saying there's no no good examples from there. Germany actually did some cool things during the pandemic that I want to read more about. Um, but it's a very different reality for working people uh, in those places, right? There's a question on here. Oh, another screen. I need to look behind me. Droves have quit their training. Yeah. Yeah, it's a huge problem. Um, I think the, I saw a stat recently on, on nurses where the average nurse works for five years and then they leave. That's what we're at right now. Um, so we really need to think about retention. Um, oh, it disappeared. But there was a question there about nurses. Um, and they, yeah, that's happening. People quit training during panic, or they couldn't get their training. Uh, I don't know if you saw the University of Lethbridge had a faculty strike uh, recently. I went down to the picket line, yeah. Um, and the faculty offered to keep doing, I forget the name of it, but like the placement so the nurses could finish their schooling and start being a nurse on time, even though there was a strike, and the employer said no. 
the university said, nope, it's your fault that they're not going to become nurses this year. Too bad. And that kind of attitude is just uh, to me. But yeah, we need to really figure out a way. Nobody wants to become a paramedic right now. It's even worse than nursing. Why would you want that job is kind of the attitude. Uh, and people are leaving that profession in droves too. And, and it's work conditions. It's how they're treated. You know, nurses who worked their butts off for getting called in every day they're off and then the health minister stands up and says they're greedy for working overtime. They're gaming the overtime system. It's like, no, you're not hiring enough nurses. And they're having to work overtime so that there's care, right? So I, I think, again, it goes back, like respect would be a huge step forward just based on my conversations with healthcare workers. Um, but then actually encouraging people to go into those fields and there's, there's all that needs to happen for sure. Because um, a lot of... A lot of young people are like, why would I do this job when I could do something else, right? At this point. Ooh, okay, not all, this is on. Yeah. Um, not all surgeries have been uh, privatized. And I'm just wondering, is there any way as an ordinary citizen, we don't know when we're being referred by a physician or family doctor to uh, have an, uh, a surgery done. Can we request, do we have the authority to request to re be referred to the public facility rather than private? Um, you could ask to see which you're going to because you may not even know. That's a common thing where people, they just go where they're sent, right? And they have no idea. Um, so you could definitely ask. Um, like there are lots of times people request a different surgeon for different reasons, the consult or whatever. It could mean you're even further into the wait list, right? Depending if you, if you try to not take the first available spot. But you can always ask for someone else, specialist that if you want to. It just may impact your weight, right? But I, I would say don't be afraid to ask, right? If you're like, is this a private place or not? You can do that. They should be able to tell you. People um, are often scared of their doctor, but you should ask lots of questions about these things. Um, John, in regards to your question, in the Edmonton Journal, uh, there was an editorial yesterday or the day before by somebody who's saying that the European system wouldn't work in Canada because in Europe they, it's more collective and caring, we're more individualistic in Canada. And also um, in Germany, apparently the w employers pay most of the health care benefits for the mm -hmm. people. and. Uh, and the message was Canadians yeah, wouldn't go for that. So. Yeah, they actually have legislation that requires employers to provide certain things, right? Mm -hmm. So it's on the employer side instead of mm -hmm. the tax mm -hmm. side, yeah. Thank you, Chris, great. that's uh, Thank you for, for your you. great information. Great. Okay. Thank you. We appreciate it. Obviously, we're going to have to have more conversations with you, Chris. <laughs> Thank you for being with us. Our hymn, Hymn 134, Our World is One World. What a good title.
my goodness. <laughs> Before we go on to having the um, Raging Grannies, I want to give our thanks to the volunteers without whom which this would never happen. It feels like almost like a, a Hollywood movie production where everybody has to be in the right places and they're doing the right things or nothing happens. So that my list includes Andrew Mills, Mark Booker, Susan Rattan, Pauline Atwood, Gloria Crenbrook, and a whole bunch of other people that I have not noticed well enough. Now for the I would say the second part of the program is the Raging Grannies, who sing of social protest and can be found at every rally that you can name. And where are they? Are you going to? Okay, Raging Granny, do your thing. We just have two short songs to sing for you. Um, and so um, after uh, Premier Ralph Klein resigned, he said he wasn't able to institute private health care because of the Raging Grannies and the NDP. Uh, so I knew what I had to join, and uh, as probably the rest of the Raging Grannies. Okay. And we've been doing this for 30 years. 30 years we've been doing this. But we'll just sing our songs now. Okay. <laughs> Public health care is at risk this year. Soon what we'll hear is sorry, no that's here. We can't help you with your troubles. Get out on the double. Go to private clinics or come back next year. Promise us big changes instead. 
that you all go to the Friends of Medicare site and you sign up and then you'll get uh, regular emails about the things that are happening in regards to our Medicare system. Okay? And I'm going to ask the, uh, Louise and Sylvia uh, as representatives of the grannies to uh, extinguish the chalice. And I would say that in the closing words for that is that may we all unite, maybe not as radically and verbally as the Raging Grannies intend to keep doing for the next 50 or so years, but if we can find it in our hearts to find one small thing that we can go and tell Chris that we can do to help friends of Medicare, that would, I think, help things move along a lot easier. You have learned something today? something special and we know that we're not ever too old to care. We will be singing Carry the Flame unless you, yes, we'll be singing Carry the Flame because there is not a postlude. This is the postlude. Thank you.